disciples. There was a wealthy landowner who, having received reports of a steward mismanaging the property, summoned the steward and said, what is this I hear about you? Give me an account of your service, for it is about to come to an end. The steward thought, what will I do next? My employer is going to fire me. I cannot dig ditches. I'm ashamed to go begging. I have it. Here is a way to make sure that people will take me into their homes when I am let go. So the steward called in each of the landowner's debtors. The steward said to the first, how much do you owe my employer? The debtor replied, a hundred jars of oil. The steward said, take your invoice, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then to another, the steward said, how much do you owe? The answer came, a hundred measures of wheat. And the steward said, take your invoice and make it 80. Upon hearing this, the owner gave the devious worker credit for being enterprising. Why? Because the children of this world are more astute in a dealing with their own kind than are the children of light. So I tell you, make friends for yourself through the use of this world's goods, so that when they fail you, you will be welcomed into an eternal home. If you can trust others in little things, you can also trust them in greater. And anyone unjust in a slight manner will also be unjust in a greater. If you cannot be trusted with filthy lucre, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's money, who will give you your own? Subordinates cannot have two superiors. Either they will hate the one and love the other, or be attentive to one and despise the other. You cannot worship both God and money. The good news of salvation. In the name of the holy and undivided Trinity. One God. Amen. So we have some texts here that really are problematic by themselves, and together we get more problems. And I think that's kind of illustrative of the life in which we live. So I'm going to start by situating us in Amos's time. The book of Amos is the earliest representation of prophetic literature. And when we think of prophets, these are people that often transcend our time. It's not in the current. It's somehow that one foot is in the past and another foot is in the present. And somehow the prophet has to stand here in between. I once had a priest that told me that the difference between the priest and the prophet 
is that the priests stand on the line of the sand. And that's hard to note. God is mysterious. And what feels awful in the now, the right now, it's hard for us. We can't imagine dealing with all the things happening around us that aren't just our own problems, my own problems. And so standing on the line in the sand is tough enough because you're going for between. The prophet is the person she said, is the one that crosses that line in the sand. And I can't imagine what that does to the human body. And we can think of a human, we can think of God coming down and being willing to walk with us. And we're saying, okay, we're here on God's journey with God. We're walking a journey with God. How impossible to come here where we just don't get these things. These things can't make sense. We have to do the best we can with what we've got. And a lot of that happens in community, like where we are right now. So Amos prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel and is in the last quarter of the 8th century before the common era. And his audience was, he was delivering a message to people who were wealthy and they lived in luxury. Look around. We're in Greenwich Village. I just had to figure out this summer what it was like to rent an apartment. I moved here from Georgia to a seminary where it was all figured out. I've got one word, it's sinful. <laughs> Amos's hopes, when you read Amos, he's delivering a message of hope to the vulnerable. Well, when we go out this door, it doesn't look real vulnerable, but we're looking from our lenses. That's part we've got to remember, is we have to look inward. His radical and sometimes even grotesque rhetoric is designed to elicit feelings of self-disgust. We don't like that. That's the part where we have to look in where it's easier to blame corporate America in those times for everything that's happening now, even though we can very much be part of what makes corporate America that product. Because we are also living our lives and doing the very best that we can. So when we're going out there and doing that, we can be part of something that's systematic. And we'll go back there. In First Timothy today, we have general problems in Timothy altogether. This is someone who wants women to sit over on the side silent and lets general society be silent and what's the men doing the pray. But we have some uplifting messages in that. It's not all cast off from there. It's attributed to Paul and Paul himself can be problematic and he was a trouble twisted soul. He himself can be a problem but this is actually a letter that was studied by scholars. It's just not truly attributed to Paul. This is, this would be plagiarism in that time. So you're saying, okay, I can't speak for myself. So I'm just going to call it Paul because people are already listening to Paul. So if I put Paul in that letter, others are going to start listening. And so understanding the context of the time is important for us. We are called to wrestle with the word. We're called to wrestle. And, and that's no small work. We're called to deal with this stuff, but, but the parts we can do is we can study and we can discern and we can pray. And that's the interesting thing about this part of Timothy is we're called to pray. And that's how we have community with God. We come together in that moment of prayer with God. So whether we're walking down the road and we're talking to God, or if we're in corporate prayer, like right now, we're talking to God. And, we're, and hopefully we're listening. The goal is not to sit back and stay quiet, though. Because if we look around, we have a lot of good reasons not to sit back and stay quiet.
Timothy likes rubrics. Well, I'm Episcopalian, y'all are Catholic. And we find comfort in those rubrics, and rubrics do something for us. They provide a framework, a starting place. So when things are really, really tough around us, we need that starting place so that we can just situate ourselves and find some God. I think also Timothy is doing something here. Well, Paul, or the person writing on behalf of not Paul, is doing something here where, do you know when, do you know when you're really worried about something and you just need to be told that things are okay or you just have to remind yourself, you know what, one foot in front of the other? Well, it's terrible advice. It might get you through the day, but it doesn't really work. Your psychotherapist will have something to say about that for good reason. And I think this is one of those one foot in front of the other moments where, where it's a reminder, it's an encouragement to Timothy as well, but also to the writer of this epistle saying, it's going to be okay. Because it, it's saying, let's pray, let's talk to God. We're going to do what we're called here to do. He talks about truth and faith. And so if we kind of define Truth, I think we could say that truth is conviction based on evidence or proof verified with experience. So that's kind of more your scientific side. It's where I'm more comfortable. And there's faith, where it's conviction that's based on one's belief in the trustworthiness of God, regardless of evidence. So I went to seminary with a background. I have a I have a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry. <laughs> and my faculty were so excited about this. They were like, we really want to be here. And I thought, why? Do you understand the process I go through to arrive at a conclusion? And so I kind of sat quietly and felt like an imposter for a little while at seminary. And, and just didn't feel like I belonged. And, and then, my profession is accountancy. I have a mass, master's of accountancy. And so I represented scientists, so they come together. I represented scientists to the IRS and claimed tax credits for corporate America. And now here I am saying I'm a diploma priesthood. And so I had this evidence thing, but the thing was, I wasn't willing to give up with, I, I wanted to wrestle. I like texts like Jacob. I wanted to go back and forth across the Java because for whatever reason, I thought that felt good. And, and then Jeremiah, oh, look, look at that. Um, there comes a point when you just have to trust. The spiritual part happens and I fell in love with those classes. I fell in love with the spirit of trust because through that, you know, I always knew it didn't need an examination one over another to prove that it was right. There are certain things we just know. And when we think about Amos writing to this group, and I can't imagine speaking to this group and giving a report from God and saying, you know what, you're all, let's go out there. Like if we all went out there and just said, you're all, you're all wrong. You need to give back. This is not okay. What, what would that be like? I can't imagine. My seniors didn't call me to preach on the corner. Thank God. But, but we're dealing with a part where it says this is an oracle of judgment. And it's God's unrelenting eye that's seen everything in front of us. All right, so everything we're doing, that doesn't feel good right now. And, and we're trampling on the needy. But let's think about what that means, needy. It doesn't always mean money. I'm an accountant and say, this, none of the scripture is all about money. It's not about money. It's the first thing I've said that. Is it's just not. This is a breed incapable of taking a Sabbath. It's the moments the night before when you're wrestling with tomorrow that you cannot know or do. That's tomorrow, and it's gonna happen. And guess what? You're already good enough because you're called to be there. So you just have to show up. 
But I'm one of those people who just wrestle and wrestle and I'm terrified the night before and could stay up all night terrified of something to control tomorrow, something that's not my job. So imagine a greed so greedy that it's obsessed with something that's not happening right now. Like we're all here together and we're alone. We've all taken time because this matters and wrestling with it. When everything matters, you don't have time or tomorrow because you're gonna be there and you're gonna do it. That's, that's not there. So why don't we take this word, word of warning that Amos so long ago, we're talking over 2000 years, he's the early one, is giving us and we still cannot hear. In fact, when we look at this passage and we say, okay, they're doing that, they're doing that, you know, Amazon could do better, others can do better. We're looking for someone to blame when we, when, yeah, they could do better. They, they really could do better. But we need to self-identify here. It's not lit, we don't have to do it extreme. But what we need to take a moment of reflection because there's other ways to harm than money. There's other ways we dismiss, we don't hear, we don't stop, we don't think, we don't just feel. And those are injustices and become a part of systematic injustice. And then we would make our way to this parable really complicated parable. I kind of broke it down into parts. Part one is we have rich man as a manager. Then we have a problem in verse two, the manager is accused of mismanagement. He must account for his accounting. And then in verse three, manager considers options. <laughs> yeah, we've never done that, right? <laughs> Manager establishes a strategy in verses four through seven. And then rich man evaluates manager's strategy. So this parable is referred to as the shrewd manager and the cunning manager. And I think it depends on where you fall out on the words. And marketing people are really good at this stuff, so they can apply a word to have a certain feeling or emotion or evoke that from you. <clears throat> and this text is complicated because technically the money is the so called rich. And then we have this manager, he decides he can't do certain things. Either he can't be a servant in a certain role, he's not willing to do it. It's just not, it's not where he's willing to go back to. He likes being manager. He's arrived. So he's not comfortable going back to these other roles. He sees them as beneath him. And then we have this rich man who, who could be charging incredible interest so that when we see the discounts that are happening in this story, are they really discounts or was it so inflated? Like what we're so used to facing, like interest rates or credit cards or, or any of these deals that are made that essentially come at a cost to other people. I think what it really comes down to is shrewdness is not necessarily always a bad thing, but how can we use that? for God's vision. In what ways are we taking Amos's message, his rich early message, and saying we can apply this to be the best person today. Maybe I can spend a little more time trying to get you. I'll never understand, I'm not you. But maybe I can spend just a little more time being present and in the moment, which is, Probably what I see as the redeeming message of Timothy is just calling us back home to God. And so when it's called to live for the light, the so-called enlightened, 
How are we enlightened by God? How does that enlightenment calls us to be a better, better form of ourselves? Amen. Amen.